pH 3 and the mass percent pH 3, probably my activity level. Uh, he's very modest, he doesn't say that in his bio. Uh, Joshua is one of the first uh, people who worked uh, on uh, 3D electromagnetic sensors. Uh, the capacitive sensor, the 2D capacitive, capacitive sensor that we have on your iPhone nowadays is a special case of that uh, work. He worked on electromagnetic, electromagnetic sensing, 3D electromagnetic sensing, uh, as early as uh, 97, 98. And I invite you to check out uh, his website and his videos, which, which are quite uh, impressive. Uh, also, he received the Best Paper Award, uh, award from uh, uh, last SICOM, uh, SICOM 2013 uh, at Hong Kong, on ambient uh, backscatter. Uh, he's going to show a, a couple of things uh, today around that project. And also, he received the Best Paper Award on RFID conference uh, last spring, RFID uh, 2014, on uh, multiband energy harvesting, where we're going, to see, we're going to see exactly how he did it. So, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm also looking forward to learning about the excellent research in Agalosis group uh, because we're kindred spirits working on similar things. I'm hoping this is going to lead to some collaborations. And one of Agalosis students is coming to the University of Washington uh, to finish his PhD uh, starting in September. So that's exciting to see this kind of collaboration uh, developing. <clears throat> so today I'm going to be telling you about basically an overview of the research in our group. Um, so I'm going to be talking about RF-powered sensing, commuting, and communication. Um, <clears throat> you know, we'd like to get rid of batteries altogether, so, um, <clears throat> but we don't want to have to re resort to perpetual motion machines, such as this one, which I've taken from the patent literature. Um, but uh, instead, <clears throat> we're going to try to do uh, uh, maybe the next best thing, which is to harvest power from uh, the ambient environment. Um, so I'll, I'll talk more about that. I'd like to start by just uh, thanking my uh, graduate students and, and, and postdocs who have done all the work that I'm going to be showing you. So, <clears throat> you know, why RF power? Why would you want to power things uh, using RF signals instead of uh, batteries? Well, there, it's kind of interesting to look, you know, sort of think about what are the specific benefits, because there are actually several different ones. You know, cord elimination, not too hard to understand. You'd like to get rid of all these cords. Uh, you could do that using batteries, uh, <clears throat> but those have problems too. Uh, of course, batteries run out. Even rechargeable batteries will fail after 10 years or something like that of recharging. Um, and batteries are also large, heavy, uh, and in some of the applications that I'll be talking about, you know, one of these constraints is, is more important than others. So we'll see some applications where weight is the key issue, others where it's lifetime or, or, or size. Another benefit that I like to think about, these two stills are from uh, the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, these are the monolith. Uh, if you look at something like this, this iPhone, um, you know, it's not quite a featureless uh, uh, monolithic object. It has, it has buttons, it has connectors, you know, for power. Um, and, uh, you know, if we could transfer the power wirelessly, then potentially we could make these things completely seamless, which actually I would have liked last week when I went swimming in the Aegean with my iPhone in my pocket. Uh, we need that a little bit uh, sooner. Uh, but we'll also see that the same benefit really applies uh, for biomedical uh, situations because, of course, we don't have connectors going through my skin to get power and data in and out of my body uh, for implanted electronics. There's also kind of a design benefit. So many devices like cell phones uh, you know, have an antenna already for communication. Um, of course, I had to find a picture of an old cell phone to find one that had an external antenna. Um, you know, devices like this have the antenna inside it. But this device is obviously designed to pass our signals already. Uh, so if I could use the same, you know, industrial design uh, to pass power, that would be nice. Versus, you could also imagine, you know, solar powering things. Um, but, you know, by definition, solar cells are black. They're, they're typically glass or plastic. So you have to change the outside. Um, you know, of course, you guys have a lot of sun here, so maybe... Uh, Solar power makes a little bit more sense. You know, coming from Seattle, where it's dark for you know half the year, uh, we really don't want to rely on the on, on sun. So RF power is a nice uh, advantage from that point of view. So 
Here's a kind of map of the space of wirelessly powered systems. Um, so I divide the space into <coughs> near field and far field. Uh, so far field is small amounts of power delivered over very large distances. Uh, near field tends to be much larger amounts of power over shorter distances. And I also uh, sometimes divide the space into uh, planted and wild. So <coughs> by planted power, I mean power that we deliberately transmitted for the purpose of, of powering something. And by wild, I mean power that's pre-existing. So for example, RF signals from TV or cell phones that were already uh, put there. And these, uh, these project names that I have in the boxes, uh, I'll, I'll be telling you about. So I'm going to start by telling you about WISP, which was uh, kind of my first uh, project in this area. It stands for Wireless Identification and Sensing Platform. And what you see over here, this looks like a picture frame. Uh, it's actually an RFID reader antenna. And then I have a little stack of boards in my hand, which is actually an RFID tag that we created from discrete components. Um, and it has a uh, sensor and microcontroller, which is what is different than a conventional RFID tag. So, let's see, hopefully this video is playing. Um, so the key thing is that, it's a little bit hard to see, I guess, but that little stack of boards has no battery. Um, it's being powered by the RF signals that are coming from the reader antenna. And as I tilt it back and forth, the accelerometer is detecting gravity showing up on the three different uh, channels. So as I tilt it, we can figure out what the tilt is. Um, and then it's communicating using backscatter, which is a technique that Agalos uh, and his group also work on. Uh, and this is a technique which is very, very low power because instead of having this little stack of boards here uh, generate its own radio signal, all it is doing is reflecting the radio signal that the reader is generating. And this is a technique that uh, you know is very power efficient. I think it's you know very promising. Um, there are not that many people working on this <clears throat> for reasons that I still don't completely understand. Uh, you know, I think that this technique has substantial benefits, and uh, you know, we're going to see a lot more uh, practical application of this uh, in the future. Right now, there are a very relatively small number of people working on this, including Agalos, Matt Reynolds, my group, you know, a few others. Not that many, but I think this technique really. Um, is going to have a big impact. Um, and I'll be showing you other extensions of this as we go. <clears throat> so in terms of what is inside uh, the device I just showed you, this block diagram here <clears throat> looks very much like an RFID tag uh, with a couple of differences. So there's an antenna, some impedance matching, make sure I show you that here. Uh, power harvesting, <clears throat> some voltage regulation. Um, there's some circuitry for extracting the signal from the reader, uh, and also the backscatter uh, circuit here, which essentially just changes the impedance of this antenna that changes the reflection that's generated. Um, and then the blocks that are different are we have this programmable microcontroller and external sensor. So what this uh, means is that we can actually write software and run it on this device that is being powered by reading. And I think people hadn't really done this before. Uh, before the WISP, uh, the assumption had been that the power consumption uh, of the microcontroller was too high to run off of ambient RF signals. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what, what made that possible. Here's a little bit more detail on, on what's inside uh, those blocks. So I'll talk, tell you about some of these different blocks in a moment. So this is the power harvester. This is the circuit for extracting data from the uh, reader's signal. And then here's some power management. <clears throat> OK, so uh, this, this shows you a uh, rectifying charge pump. So this extracts the power from the, uh, from the reader's signal. Now I'm going to start a little simulation here, hopefully. Let's see if this starts up. If you can see it. Okay, so it's a little bit difficult to see, but in this visualization, uh, the dots represent current and the color represents voltage. So, so 
down here, this represents the antenna. So the uh, reader signal is generating an alternating uh, signal going back and forth. Um, <clears throat> this kind of ladder of diodes here is doing two things. It's, it's rectifying, which means it converts from AC to DC, and it's also providing us with some voltage gain. Um, so you know, each of these stages contributes a little bit more voltage gain. So up here, we have you know, the highest uh, voltage uh, out. Um, let's see if I drag this down. I've actually measured the voltage at three different points in this circuit. It's a little hard to read, but you know, in this example, uh, you know, let's see what does it say, 20, 20 something volts. And these specific numbers don't matter, but uh, <clears throat> the point is that as you move up higher here, you get uh, more and more voltage. So the key, uh, you know, the reason this is important is when you think about these wirelessly powered sensor systems, there are really two constraints. There's a power constraint and there's a voltage constraint. So if I can adjust the power consumption by having the device sleep most of the time and waking up once in a while. So it's very easy to adjust the, the power consumption. In some ways, the more difficult constraint is voltage because if my power harvester is only producing one volt, let's say, then my circuit can't turn on and operate at all. So there's kind of a hard constraint, which is that you need sufficient voltage uh, for this to operate. Um, and then there's this power constraint, which is very easy to kind of work around, assuming that the device sleeps uh, increasingly. Um, so that's one of the challenges in power harvesting, is creating a uh, device that can harvest from very, very low uh, signal levels. And we'll talk uh, more, more about that as we go. Um, okay, so now what I'm going to show you is just, I mentioned this just now, but I'm going to show you exactly how uh, the device is able to decrease its power consumption to match the power available. So this is a very simple scheme. Um, the red trace here is the harvested voltage. So starting from zero, we, we turn on the RF signal, it starts charging up, and we have these two, oh sorry, you can't see that. So we're this red line charging up from zero. We have these two thresholds here, two voltage thresholds. So when the device exceeds the upper threshold, it wakes up, the microcontroller starts operating, it senses, uh, it starts backscattering, and that consumes, consumes energy. So the voltage on its storage capacitor drops until it gets to this lower threshold, at which point it goes to sleep, and then starts charging up again until it's above the upper threshold. So if the tag were further from the reader, um, this upper slope would be shallower, and it would take longer to charge up. The downward slope is about the same because it's always communicating at the same rate and so forth. So what this very simple mechanism with the two thresholds does is, it has the effect of exactly matching the power consumed to the power available. So when the tag is further away, there's less power available. It simply means that it takes longer to charge up, and so the update rate drops, and it has the, the effect of just matching the power consumed exactly to the power available. So that's a very, very simple scheme. Um, the problem with it is that these time constants are determined by hardware. So there's a capacitor size, uh, and that size determines how long it takes uh, to charge up. What we might like to do, oh, and then I, I should also say, the workload so the computational workload that we're executing affects the downward slope. So uh, you know, let's say I need to encrypt the data that I'm going to send back. That takes more computation, which means it takes, takes more energy. So this slope is going to be longer. Uh, you know, if I run out of energy before the computation is complete, I may not ever be able to finish it. So what uh, my colleagues, uh, David Weatherall and um, my computer worked on is a software-based energy harvest, uh, energy scheduling uh, system uh, for this. So the problem is if, <clears throat> let's see, if you if you if you wait too long before waking up, then you're sort of you're not functioning, you're not getting as much computation out as you could. On the other hand, if I wake up too early and then don't complete the computation that I may never be able to do anything. So there are these two competing problems. You wake up too early, you wake up too late. Um, uh, there, there are two 
two ways to fail. So what Dewdrop allows you to do is in software, uh, sort of empirically exactly find the optimal point. If you wake up too early, uh, then next time you wake up a little longer, and the system ends up kind of servoing to this optimal point where you kind of exactly balance uh, waiting too long, waiting too early. And the key is that different applications, you know, different programs that are running on this hardware will have different uh, kind of optimal points. And so this is a, this is a way to, um, uh, to find, find the optimal points. So the reason I, I'm highlighting this is just because it's interesting. We have this new class of device. It's, it's RF powered. Um, and you need to start thinking about how to, you know, how to write software that, uh, that works on this, this type of device. Now, one thing that's been exciting about the WISP is that we uh, built these devices and gave them uh, out to very, uh, you know, lots of people, and uh, they did different applications. So this is one of my favorites. It just kind of came out of the blue. Uh, Luciano Trasati at INFN in Italy uh, is using it uh, for sensing uh, seawater. So this is for the undersea neutrino observatory that's being built in the Mediterranean. Um, they have these photomultiplier tubes. They're going to eventually deploy 10,000 of them in a one kilometer cube under the Mediterranean. Um, and what they're doing right now is, uh, or what he wanted to do, is simply, as long as they're deploying all this infrastructure, he wanted to measure the temperature of the seawater. So he mounted the wisp to the outside of the sphere, put the reader inside the sphere. And so the wireless power and all that is just being used to get through this one centimeter of glass. So this is an example of the sort of boundary integrity. I mean, there's power close by. The issue is he didn't want to punch an extra hole in this glass sphere, which is expensive and risky. Um, so in this case, the benefit of wireless power and data is simply getting through this very critical boundary, this high pressure uh, gradient boundary. And we'll see that, that sort of benefit coming up in other places. What kind of data do you have inside the It's from, uh, some local company said, C-A-E-N, I think is the reader. And then they've also made some custom readers. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to skip over a couple of projects here just to move a little bit faster. Uh, <clears throat> this is another one we've done recently uh, called the EEG WISP, so electroencephalography WISP. Uh, the student you see here wearing this uh, attractive outfit is uh, Artem Dementiev, who's actually left my group to join Joe Paradiso at the Media Lab. Um, so this, uh, you know, they, you can buy EEG devices now for playing games and things like that. And of course, there are many medical applications of electroencephalography. The goal here is, can we build uh, one that is wirelessly powered and read? Uh, and the answer is, to some extent, yes. So this is uh, one of the sort of simple tests that one does to verify that EEG is working. Um, basically distinguishing eyes closed from eyes open, you get a very different brain signal in those two different configurations. So this shows that uh, we were able to do this. Um, but uh, the caveat is that you know, it takes quite a bit of time, and there turns out to be interference between the reader and the sensing. So the reader's blasting this large RF signal, and it's encoded with, with data. And if you try to do this very sensitive sensing at the same time as the reader is blasting all this power and data, um, you get interference. So the very crude thing we're doing right now to, to get this working for the first time is simply alternating. We have a period when we're sensing, then we stop sensing and do the communication. But the reason I highlight this is because I think this is one of the kind of interesting research uh, questions that has come up, which is how do you balance uh, these sort of competing functions of sensing, communication, and power? Uh, the protocols and the systems that exist right now are not designed support sensing at the same time as communication of power. I think it can be done, uh, but the existing systems don't do it. So this is one of the things that, that we're thinking about how to do. And here's another uh, <coughs> extension of backscatter communication. Um, in some ways, it's going back to the, the early days of it. Um, <coughs> so all the sensing I've showed you so far is sensing you know, something like 10 hertz, 20 hertz, small, small update rates, small amounts of power. But can we do something like audio? You know, audio, 20 kilohertz is the highest you know, frequency that humans can hear. So worst case, you might have to sample at something like 40,000 samples per second. So 
and many orders of magnitude higher than, than what I showed you. So <clears throat> we took inspiration to try to solve this problem from uh, a, a bug that was created by actually Leon Theremin uh, back in 1940 or something like that. So this great seal of the United States was given by some Soviet Boy Scouts to the United States Embassy. Uh, ambassador. They measured it, didn't seem to be emitting any radio signals, so they thought, okay, we'll hang it on the ambassador's wall for seven years. Uh, it turns out the whole time it was a bug. Um, it had a metal membrane. The sound in the room would cause the metal membrane to move, and that would cause, uh, as that metal membrane got closer and further from this antenna, it would change the reflection coefficient of the antenna. Um, and this is actually essentially backscattered communication. So the Soviets would park a truck outside the embassy, turn on a strong RF signal, and listen to the backscatter. So the audio in the room was actually modulating the reflection of this radio signal in a way that you could actually hear uh, the speech. And so, you know, digital backscatter, which we do now, is we're just picking two states, you know, reflect or don't reflect as much as possible. In this case, we're doing an analog uh, modulation. So what we've done here now with the WISP is we've combined the digital uh, backscatter that, that we already had with the WISP. So here are the two branches of the antenna. Here's our transistor that we use for digital backscatter. By shorting or opening that transistor, we dramatically change the reflection coefficient of this antenna. Um, but then at the same time, we've also added a microphone with an analog enable switch here. So we can talk to the WISP, communicate with it, find out its ID, uh, and then we can command it to go into an analog backscatter mode, at which time we close this switch, and then the microphone starts um, modulating the antenna. So this uh, sequence shows, this is the digital communication with the reader, and then this is the backscattered audio uh, from the microphone. And I'll see if I can play this play this sound here. So the first sound sample, well, let me just play this again. Um, this is from uh, 0.7 meters, fairly close. And then it's 7 meters. that. So, you know, the sound quality is obviously much worse at seven meters, but, you know, it's a hugely greater range. Um, so, you know, I think this is exciting because potentially you could imagine something like, you know, we're talking about transmitting voice now with no batteries. So maybe my phone has a mode in which I can actually do some voice communication with no batteries whatsoever. You know, I, I'm, I'm still going to need the battery so that my kids can play, you know, Flappy Bird or whatever <laughs> the latest game is. Uh, but, you know, maybe after they've burned the battery down to zero in the car, and they need to call for a tow truck or something, you know, being able to make a low-quality voice call with, with no battery when the battery's completely dead, I think would be uh, exciting. So, you know, that's a direction we're, we're trying to go. Now, one question that I ask myself is, you know, why were we able to uh, start doing these things like the WISP uh, when 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 we were start doing it when we were able to start doing them and I think this slide kind of answers that to some extent so this looks if you don't look very carefully this looks like a, a Moore's law plot that you've seen many times where we have you know decades here typically on the most Moore's law plots this vertical axis is number of transistors but what I've plotted here is instructions per microjoule so this plot is showing the energy efficiency of um, and usually when people look at the energy efficiency of computing, they plot the inverse of this. Instead of instructions per microjoule, they do energy per instruction, the inverse, which is it's harder to see. You don't see this nice exponential. But what you see here is that from you know, the first computer in 1940 to a recent laptop, the energy efficiency has improved by a factor of a trillion, you know, 10 to the 12th. So enormous improvement in energy efficiency. And that's why you know, we can now, we're starting to be able to power programmable general purpose computing devices using these very small uh, RF signals. And it's also interesting that, you know, if you, there are many estimates of the brain's energy efficiency, uh, but they're all kind of 
somewhere around here, maybe plus or minus an order of magnitude. It doesn't change much on this plot. Um, so this, this tells you that in principle, there are actually quite a bit of room, maybe six orders of magnitude to go in energy efficiency. And in fact, that's not even all that aggressive, uh, because if you look at the fundamental physical limits of computation, according to you know, Landauer, uh, Feynman, uh, Charlie Bennett, well, there really isn't any limit, so this curve just keeps going on forever. Um, the other thing I think is exciting about that is if you think about it, we come back to uh, uh, wirelessly powered uh, computing devices. Um, so this plot is similar to the last one. So this is instructions per microjoule for microcontrollers, not for complete computer systems like the last one. So you see this exponential improvement trend. <clears throat> and then this curve here is saying, let's pick a workload. So like that sensing example with the uh, planet that I showed you first. Let's assume we always want to do that job. And now we ask the question, at what range, at what distance can I power that particular workload, assuming that the amount of energy I can transmit is fixed by law, and the amount of energy required is improving exponentially, according to this trend. What that tells you is, you know, because RF power falls off as you know, 1 over R squared, it tells you that the distance at which I'm going to be able to power any particular workload is increasing exponentially, but the slope is one half of the underlying energy efficiency scaling curve. So the exciting thing about that is that you know, things that we're barely able to do now, you know, we can maybe power it at you know, a couple of meters, that means that you know, in a few more years of, of energy efficiency scaling, we're going to go from you know, below 10 meters to above 10 meters which is a really, really important threshold, I think, because then you can imagine having one device that's in your house that will power all these sensors uh, and you know, maybe even phone-like things. So <clears throat> in this area, uh, you know, some of the research challenges, sort of the bad news is that voltage limits range and our ability to harvest. The good news is that from a physics point of view, you know, voltage is not a conserved quantity. We can boost voltage we're clever in various ways. I showed you one circuit already. Uh, <clears throat> I think there's opportunities to design voltage boosting active harvesters as opposed to the sort of passive uh, diode-based harvesters I've shown you so far. Um, in a, sort of a device level, coming up with uh, rectifying elements, things like diodes and transistors uh, that can operate at lower voltages, I think is an opportunity. Um, another thing I think is interesting is what I sometimes call metabolic harvesting. So if you, if you think about biological creatures, I mean, what they're doing all the time is harvesting energy. Uh, that's what they do. Um, but the, the creature doesn't have sort of a power supply that it just assumes it's going to work, and then the applications it's trying to execute or the things it's trying to do, those things are tied together. So you can imagine that future energy harvesting systems will actually uh, manage their own energy consumption and collection uh, in an active way. The device might say, well, you know, I need to get this work done, so I'm going to save, I'm going to go to sleep now, then I'm going to start my harvester. Um, another kind of key difference between the sorts of harvesters I've showed you so far in biological systems is that you know, we expect our harvesters to be, to be able to go to sleep, to run out of energy completely, and then to start up again. But a living system, if it runs out of energy, that's it, it's over. Um, and I think that provides more flexibility, most likely. And so I think that future, more sophisticated energy harvesting systems may have that same sort of hard constraint, that they cannot run completely out of energy, just, just the way a living creature would actually die if it runs out of energy. Because that means, you know, if it has to use its own energy to collect more energy, it can employ more sophisticated energy harvesting schemes. So now I'll tell you about uh, different quadrant uh, of the square. So WISP was here. We were in the far field, but planted power because we had the RFID reader deliberately transmitting power. Now, <clears throat> what we realized is that uh, TV towers are putting out an amount of energy such that, or power such that uh, at several kilometers away, we have basically the same amount of power that uh, an RFID reader puts out. So this is a TV tower in Seattle. Um, <clears throat> It's located here, 
at uh, you know four or five kilometers away, you'd expect to be able to get about 100 microwatts. So it's putting out one million watts, and we're getting 100 microwatts out here. Uh, further away, uh, we can get something like 25 microwatts. Um, this is our older uh, harvesting uh, system, and this gives us negative 9 dBm of sensitivity. What that means is that we need 125 microwatts of RF power to be coming in, or we can't operate at all. So this is the sort of voltage threshold I was telling you about. You know, we have this hard constraint. We can't do anything unless we're above this amount of power. And in terms of, say, the previous slide, that means that you know we need to be within this circle to, to operate. Now with this harvester, I've kind of separated the rectification from the DC voltage boosting function. So here we just have a couple of diodes that are doing the rectification. Then we have a DC to DC converter that gives us the voltage gain. And this turns out to give us uh, something like negative 18 dBm sensitivity, or in other words, we only need 15 microwatts of incoming RF power to be able to operate. Um, so that increases our range substantially. That moves us out to this much larger circle here. Um, and let's see, I'll just point to this plot here. This shows the older harvester. Basically, if you come out to you know five or six kilometers, it stops working. This new harvester design works way out beyond 20 kilometers. Again, this is assuming that we're transmitting one uh, megawatt. And one thing that's exciting that that enabled us to do is to harvest power from cell phone towers. So before uh, the new harvester, we had never managed to harvest power from, from cell phone towers. This is a, U, the UW campus. There's a large fountain here. There's a, uh, on top of this building, there's a cell tower array. We have this grid of green locations, we're able to uh, successfully power up a little sensor unit and, and transmit some data. These red locations, it didn't work. Uh, still not sure why. I have a theory that it may be multipath. So you know, there's a signal that bounces off this large uh, pool of water and maybe it interferes destructively at these two locations. Let's see, so I'll keep going past this one. Um, okay, so Agalos mentioned uh, some work on multiband harvesting that we presented at IEEE RFID. So all the RF harvesting I showed you so far is designed to tune in one particular TV station. It's not just that it's tuned for TV, but it's for one particular channel. And we, in hardware, we have to tune it to work at that channel. But of course, if you look at the RF spectrum, uh, you know there are multiple different TV stations, and in every geographic location, the, the mix of frequencies tends to be different. Um, so what we'd like to do, this this shows uh, our existing harvester. So it's, it's narrow band, meaning it's tuned to work at a specific frequency. What we'd like to be able to do is make a multiband harvester that could capture power from all these different frequencies. Now would give us two benefits. One is flexibility, so as long as there's one of these signals available, our system will work. And the other is potentially we can get more power, because we get to potentially add the RF power from multiple sources if there are multiple sources. So uh, you know, what, what, we, what we did was took one antenna, we have multiple bandpass filters that are, are selecting different regions of the spectrum, uh, each with its own matching network and then each with its own rectifier. Then we sum those uh, together, uh, kind of adding the voltages uh, together. This shows uh, an image of the board. So you can see, in this case, it's, it's, it's designed, let me get my pointer here, it's designed for five bands. So there are five, uh, five harvesters here. Um, this shows uh, the response. Well, this is in, in an eight band. Uh, Harvester, so we can target several uh, several different frequencies. So this is the wide band antenna. This is the harvester board here. Um, now, one of the things that is, is novel here that we came up with is uh, this summation network. Um, so, <clears throat> if you naively combine the outputs uh, of, of these uh, different harvesters, so this this harvester is tuned for band one. This is for band two. If we just stack these in series, and then, but we don't have all of these bands excited, so let's say there's only one frequency present, uh, that 
is going to seriously degrade the efficiency. So we came up with this diode summation network, which kind of intelligently combines the, the power uh, from you know, whichever bands are available, it will uh, you know, use that power and it will shortcut uh, uh, the, these harvesters that are not excited. So that was one of the, um, one of the steps forward in that paper. Um, actually, the behavior of these things is very complicated. Uh, they're, they're hard to tune and, and even somewhat hard to understand. Uh, so what we've done here is, this is a simulation for an eight band system. So we, we have uh, eight frequencies, each of which can be on or off. So that's two to the eighth of 256 uh, different uh, states or you know, possible conditions that, um, that we could be harvesting power in. And then we're saying, how well does this work in each of those conditions? So, and then this act is number of excited bands. We're going to have equal power per band. So one would be just one TV station on. Of course, there are eight possible frequencies. There are going to be eight dots here. Um, and this is looking at all the different combinations. And so there's an overall upward trend, which is good. You know, the more bands we have, the more power on average we get. So that, that's good. Um, now, one question we looked at is, well, how much does that diode summation network help us? Do we really need it? Um, and, and here, the behavior is actually quite complicated. Uh, and I would say we don't totally understand this, uh, uh, or all the subtleties of this yet. Um, you know, overall, it helps. So this, this plot is showing for you know, each of the blue dots is one of the, the power conditions. So we tried every, every possibility uh, for each of these numbers of bands. And, you know, in, in some cases we have, you know, very substantial benefit. Uh, but there are some cases where, you know, some of these dots are actually negative. So it doesn't actually help you in every possible condition. Um, and we're, we're still... Uh, I think it's going to be you know, additional work to, uh, to explain exactly uh, uh, what's going on here. I don't think I have time to talk more about that, but that's an interesting thing maybe uh, to, to look at in the future. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you about uh, another uh, project in this space of far field and wild uh, power. So we call this ambient backscatter communication. And um, <clears throat> here the idea is ways you can think of this is combining uh, the two things I just showed you. So we're going to have these sensor units that are powered by ambient RF signals. So this is a TV tower maybe several kilometers away. Now what we want to do is, or the question we asked is, can we use that backscatter idea, but instead of reflecting this continuous tone uh, signal that uh, the RFID reader has deliberately put out there for us, can we reflect these pre-existing ambient signals, these TV signals, to have these devices communicate with one another. Um, so these things are, uh, you know, have no, no battery, they have a microcontroller just like the WISP, um, they're powered by <coughs> TV towers, now they can communicate to each other by just reflecting this pre-existing radio signal. So in some ways you can think of this as being like RFID, where we have these tags that can sense and so forth, but there's no, there's no reader. If there's, just, if there's just a TV tower somewhere, or maybe cell tower, these things uh, can talk to each other. So I'll show you a video here kind of illustrating uh, this. Okay, so the, the application here is uh, kind of money transfer. So imagine those are credit cards. This is a powered reader that we're using to interrogate the state of that thing. So initially there's 110 units of stored value in that card. Now, bringing on this, this, this other card here has some value. Uh, those are capacitive buttons there. So we're transferring data from the lower card to the upper card. Now we're going to bring the reader back. And now you'll see the value is 130 now. So these things actually communicated. They're, they did a CRC error checking. Uh, and that was all powered by a TV tower that was several kilometers away. Now, you know, what kinds of things can you use this for? You can imagine all these sort of devices like keys and phones and, uh, well, not phones, let's say, but uh, glasses, wallet, all these devices that aren't really electronic at all um, can potentially be tracked this way. So let's say the couch has one of these units in it, your keys have one of these units in it, now we can detect that they're close to each other, they can talk, 
uh, by doing this ambient reflection, and now the couch can maybe send you a message that you can your keys. Uh, or we can build these things into walls. One of the key benefits uh, of getting rid of batteries is that you, know, you could build the sensor into a, into a wall and never have to access it again uh, because, you know, because uh, we don't need to change the batteries and they can communicate uh, through the wall. Okay, so this just shows you know, how you only need you know, once in a while uh, using this mechanism. Okay, so that is um, that is going to be a backscatter. Uh, we've actually done we've extended this in a couple of directions. We have two more papers coming out at next year's SIGCOM on this. Uh, one is uh, trying to do it with Wi-Fi, so it would be nice to be able to reflect Wi-Fi signals. Uh, we showed uh, that uh, uh, to some extent uh, that can be done. The other is we've greatly increased the range. So in this first paper in 2013, the range of tag to tag was something like two, two or three feet at most, one or three feet. Um, we found that by using similar sorts of coding schemes to, to what is using conventional communication, we can dramatically extend the range out to you know, 10, 20 meters um, at the expense of communication rate. But uh, for many of these applications, I think that, that is that's a fine trade-off to make. Okay, so in, in this area, uh, I think you know there's a lot of future research to be done. Uh, one of the things that, that we're working on uh, is you know, continued scaling of, of, of energy and minimum harvesting voltage. So we'd like to be able to extend the range as much as possible. Uh, for example, I mentioned that we can now communicate using ambient backscatter at greater and greater ranges. But that's just from the information point of view. You also need to power these things. And so we need to continue our ability to uh, harvest uh, energy from smaller and smaller incoming signals. Um, the whole question of networking for ultra-low power and intermittent power devices is uh, uh, very wide open. Um, and I think there are also interesting possibilities in things like you know, energy-based interrupts and energy scheduling. So I showed you one example of that, which is dewdrop. Uh, by my colleagues, but I think there's a lot more. Once, once energy becomes kind of the, one of the main things you're worrying about, you can really design the system and the languages and, and so forth uh, from that point of view. Okay, so now uh, that, that concludes what I'm going to tell you about uh, far field harvesting uh, and power transfer. Now I'm going to tell you about high power, short range harvesting. So this is my former student and then postdoc, Valence and Sample. Uh, and he's powering a 60 watt light bulb wirelessly here. So the distance is, you know, three feet, something like that. The amount of power is, you know, 60 watts. So you know, millions of times more than what I was showing you before. So the way this works uh, is we have two high quality factor resonators, both well, highly tuned uh, resonators, um, one on the transmit side, one on the receive side. Um, and we couple to them inductively, so this whole system looks like one transformer, two transformers, three transformers. So if you draw the circuit, it looks like this, so there's one, two, three transformers. Um, the transfer function, you know, looks, looks like this, which is kind of messy, but uh, you'll see in a minute, we'll do a plot and you'll get some insight. So Here's a physical analog. So the transmit side resonator is like one of these uh, um, uh, pendulums. Um, the receive side is like the second pendulum. And the spring that's coupling them together is like the magnetic flux that's coupling the transmit side and the receive side. Now a system like this uh, has two normal modes. Uh, so two natural frequencies. So in one case, you can see the pendulums are moving together. That's the in-phase mode. And in the other case, they're anti-phase. Uh, so in the, back to the case of, of the coils, uh, in the in-phase in case means that the current in the transmit coil and the receive coil are going the same direction. The anti-phase case is the current in the transmit coil is going one way, and the current in the receive coil is going the opposite way. Now the key thing that you notice about these two things is that the frequency is actually different. So the frequency associated with the in-phase mode is lower than the frequency associated with the anti-phase. And the other key thing that we need to just mention is that as I tighten that spring, 
the difference in frequency between those two modes increases. Um, and that's, you know, that's called splitting. Of course, you know, chemists know all about this, physicists. Um, so now what I'm going to show you is this plot is actually a plot of that transfer function I showed you before. So the vertical axis is the energy efficiency. How much, you know, how efficiently can I transmit power? Um, this axis here is distance. So as I, when I move very close, back to the pendulum analogy, that corresponds to having a very tight spring coupling the transmit side and the receive side. And there are two normal modes. So these two branches of this uh, surface here correspond to the, the two normal modes. So if I'm at some distance, let's say five centimeters, there are actually two frequencies at which I can get very high efficiency power transfer. And one corresponds to the in-phase mode, the other corresponds to the interface mode. So the key idea is that um, most wireless power transfer systems that, that transmit to receive distance is changing all the time. So we're moving in this axis, this way. So if my system can compensate for that and pick a frequency that keeps me on top of this V-shaped ridge somewhere, then that means as, even as my transmit to receive distance changes, my power efficiency is going to be about the same. And that's, that's interesting, that's very useful. It's also kind of, at least to me, it was counterintuitive because the way I usually think about wireless power transfer is that the further away the receiver is, the less power you're going to get. What this shows is that in this situation, up to a certain point, I can move the receiver further away and get the same amount of power. Um, and so this plot shows <clears throat> if I just pick one frequency, there's going to be one, so the blue trace is just a fixed frequency, it's going to be one distance at which I work best. If I'm too close or too far away, I'm going to have low power, uh, low efficiency. On the other hand, if I adaptively pick the right frequency, then uh, I get essentially constant efficiency, and then when I get too far away, it still falls off. So this side of the curve, the red and blue actually coincide, and that corresponds to being up here on this, this surface. Um, if I, the blue trace here corresponds to the back side of this surface, so moving up the ridge, keeping going straight, and kind of fall down here. Um, if I adaptively adjust the frequency, then I move up here, and then I move along this branch. And, and keep high efficiency. So let me show you a video of that working. So in the first uh, first segment, there's no auto tuning. So you'll see that the light bulb is on at a certain distance, but if you're too close or too far away, it's off. And then in the next segment of the video, we're going to turn on auto, and you can see also orientation causes it to be off in some cases. In the next section, we're going to turn auto tuning on, and then uh, it basically stays on in a much greater variety of, of uh, configurations. So it's very, you know, very solid once you have the auto tuning on. And just quickly show you one other interesting thing. This is range extension. So we put this other resonator in the middle, and the power is actually multi-hopping from one to the next. Uh, and you can also use that to turn the corner. Um, so, let's see, I'm going to move a little bit more quickly or move towards concluding here. So one of the key applications we've been working on with this is uh, with my colleague Pramod Bondi, uh, who's at the Yale School of Medicine. Uh, we're powering implanted heart pumps this way. So left ventricular assist devices uh, are the, these pumps that uh, are put in parallel with the heart. They consume 5 to 20 watts. And today there's actually a cord that comes out the abdomen that is needed to power this thing. Um, so if we could eliminate that cord, we could eliminate the infection risk and potentially make these uh, much more uh, widely used. Um, so this is my student, Ben Waters, wearing, he's got a transmit coil here. Uh, and so this would, you know, a patient would wear something like this, and then uh, he'll show you the receive coil, which corresponds to the thing that would be implanted. So there's the receiver coil. Of course, in actuality, that would be implanted inside him. He's a very committed graduate student. For some reason, he didn't want to have that implanted. I don't know why. Um, okay, and we've actually, you know, tested this in in pigs. Uh, apologies if you don't like letting 
guts. This is actually a pig's heart. Uh, we're transferring the power from this, this transmit coil to a receive coil that's under the skin here. Uh, and, you know, it, it works. Um, okay, so another area we've been applying this is, uh, so I showed you heart sensing. Uh, brain sensing is uh, another area we've been doing a lot of work. Um, I'm not going to talk in great detail about this, but with, with our Neural Engineering Center at the UW, we're working on uh, uh, designing systems that can be implanted in the brain for long periods of time. Right now, people you know, put things in the brain for very short periods of time. Uh, we're trying to uh, put things in for longer periods of time. Also working with, with my colleagues Chet Moritz and Adrian Fairhall, <coughs> we call this brain-computer spinal interface. So. It is, if I've lost the use of my arm because of a spinal cord injury, we're going to sense in the brain and then stimulate in the spine to actuate my arm. Um, again, from my point of view, many of the challenges are the same. It's you know, power and communication. Uh, so I'll kind of conclude with uh, one other kind of fun uh, robotics project. So <clears throat> we're collaborating with Rob Wood uh, at Harvard, who is known for making these uh, bees, robotic bees. Um, he has some very exciting videos of these bees flying. Uh, but what is sort of hard to see in all the videos is that there are little fine wires coming out of the bees, which obviously limits the practicality. <clears throat> so what we're trying to do is we're working with them to power these, these things wirelessly. Now we're starting with uh, his kind of robotic cockroaches. Uh, and here's one that we're powering wirelessly. So here, here are transmit coils. Uh, and this uh, this robot, um, which he's created using similar fabrication methods to what he uses for the flying systems, um, is, uh, is 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 being powered wireless here. This is obviously early uh, early stage, and longer term, we're going to have to uh, move to a far field system uh, to have the bees uh, be able to be powered at, at longer range. But um, this this one is coming out uh, this summer at uh, Hikra. The big robotics conferences. So, in the interest of time, I'm just going to kind of skip ahead to the uh, my conclusion. Um, let's see. So, you know, wireless power is enabling us to implant electronics in the body, uh, sensors. You can imagine putting uh, all of these uh, sorts of things together. Find my pointer here. So we could have low power kind of wisp-like sensors implanted in the in the skull to, to sense intention. Um, and then we can uh, you know potentially actuate uh, a robotic arm with you know perhaps novel sensors. Uh, maybe that arm would be recharged uh, using the high high power near field uh, systems. So it's exciting to think about how all of this stuff can start to work together. Uh, and with uh, this is the book that Agalos mentioned. It is a collection of papers that covers kind of this whole area, uh, many of the things I've talked about. Uh, the other thing I want to advertise, which I, I don't have a slide for, is uh, I mentioned that we get, make WISPs available to uh, academic collaborators. Uh, we have a new version of the WISP, the WISP 5, coming out very soon, uh, and, you know, like in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. So uh, you know, maybe Agalos' students or others will be interested in, uh, in using that. So to conclude, um, you know, I think RF is a really exciting way to power uh, uh, ambient uh, sensing devices. Um, to make this happen, we need progress at, at a lot of different layers. At the device layer, layer lower voltage rectification devices. At the device and circuit uh, layer, we need to you know, continue scaling energy efficiency. Um, at uh, you know, the stuff that, that I work on, and, and Agilus works on uh, things like multiband, agile, wideband harvesting. There's a lot of interesting pro uh, uh, problems in, in that space. Um, circuits and applications, things like voltage boosting and metabolic harvesting, which I mentioned. And then at the system layer, excuse me, architectural language support for energy harvesting. Um, some of the fundamental questions that, that I, I think are interesting to look at are, you know, what are the trade-offs among these different functions of RF sensing, RF communication, and energy transfer? So far, we haven't really had to think about all three of these uh, at the same time, and typically people haven't worried too much about energy transfer at all. It's just been sort of these two. Um, networking for intermittent power, um, 
in general, how far can we actually push our empowered systems? I think it's interesting to imagine phones and laptops um, that, you know, when they run out of batteries, will still retain some functionality uh, by being able to communicate uh, using some of the techniques that I've shown you. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and conclude there. wireless microphone and the plane. <laughs>
the students see things they can do. Uh, you know, we, we use the Arduino. The way I think about it is I'm trying to teach the students what do they need you know, to be able to connect the sensor up to the Arduino. What is the analog electronics and the filtering, uh, both in the hardware and the software, that they need to understand to, to be able to do that. And that's, I think, very empowering for the students because then at the end of that one course, they can build something and, and do things, which is exciting. Versus sort of the standard depth first introduction is like solving every resistor network that you can imagine. You know that's not as exciting uh, because students can't do things as, as quickly. So that's one thought I have in that direction. We have done. We have tried something similar to here. <laughs> okay, so let's thank the speaker. <laughs> Thank you all very much.